Okay, so this is an image from inside the great cathedral in Cordoba, Spain. If you've ever had the pleasure of seeing this structure in person, then you know just how confusing it is. The red and white stripes and repeating arches that seem to go on forever are disorienting. You lose yourself in them. I mean, I have a notoriously bad sense of direction anyway, but I'm pretty sure it's a universal experience. It might also confuse you because there are some structures inside this cathedral that are very obviously not Catholic or even Christian. Beyond the horseshoe arches and geometric patterns that look like they belong in a mosque, there's the existence of the Qibla, the part of a mosque that shows the direction of Mecca, which, okay, I could explain by simply telling you that this building had once been a mosque, but the Qibla here doesn't point towards Mecca. It faces almost due south. The point I'm trying to get to here is that this building asks a lot of questions, and I'm hoping this video can answer some of them. So to answer these questions, we'll need some historical background. Let's start just after the fall of Rome, way back in the 5th century CE, when Europe was was kind of a mess. In particular, the Iberian Peninsula was politically fragmented and had a collage of corrupt and decadent Visigoth rulers. At the same time, there was a growing spread of politically stable Islamic states in northern Africa, and the spread of those communities easily jumped the Straits of Gibraltar and into the Iberian Peninsula in about the year 711. But not all was politically stable in the Islamic world. Over in Damascus, the political dynasty known as the Umayyad Caliphate had been ruling for about a hundred years. Then, a rebellion murdered every single member of the Umayyad family in about the year 750 CE, putting an end to that dynasty. Only one member of the family survived. Abid al-Rahman left Damascus and headed west. He arrived in a largely unstructured Iberia, with full knowledge that he would never be able to return to his home in Syria ever again. This resignation transformed into determination, and he began to make this strange land his home. He and his followers began building infrastructure, repairing bridges, irrigating fields so new and diverse crops could grow, often the crops that remind him of Syria, like the date palm. To really make it look like his old home, he needed to build a mosque, and in order to do this, he remembered how his ancestors had built the mosque in Damascus. About a hundred years earlier, when Islam was first spreading through the area, the Umayyads purchased half of the space of the Christian cathedral of Damascus. That cathedral, by the way, like many early cathedrals, had been built on top of and using the ruins of Roman temples, one faith building upon another faith. It happens all the time. So similar to his ancestors, al Rahman purchased space in San Vicente, a Catholic cathedral that had once been built on Roman ruins. Then, for a time, the two faiths, Christianity and Islam, shared the space with each other. But as Islam grew both in population and in wealth, the Muslim community was able to purchase the entire structure and, upon doing so, rebuilt it. I mean, they still use the old columns and arches, it saves money, and also the old architecture is interesting and it grounds this building in the history of that land. al Rahman's mosque had those stacked red and white arches from the start. Historian Maria Rosa Menencal once wrote about the effect of these arches. She said, It is futile to try to describe the nearly kinetic energy of a powerful monument like this. The effort would be akin to paraphrasing a poem, and she goes on to call it visual poetry. It's difficult to orient oneself here, and it gives a sense of otherworldliness, which I think is exactly the kind of feeling you want to have in a place of worship. Which brings us to the Qibla inside the modern cathedral. It should, as per tradition, face Mecca, but this one faces almost due south when it should face east. So, in other words, it faces the direction of Mecca if this mosque were located in Damascus. al Rahman was nostalgic for his lost home and was building a new Damascus in Cordoba. The political and social structures al Rahman began on the Iberian Peninsula continued to flourish well after his death and climaxed when his descendant, al Rahman III, declared himself the Caliph, or successor to the Prophet. Cordoba was the cultural center of Islam and Europe. It was a city where the Dimi, or non-Muslim people of Abrahamic religions like Christians and Jews, lived comfortably alongside the Muslim ruling class. 
Al Rahman III had a Jewish foreign minister and physician, and the city's library famously contained and translated many works from ancient Greece and Rome, often adding to those cultural traditions through the scholarship of philosophers like Averroes, who would have an extremely influential role in European intellectual thought. While the rest of Europe went through the medieval period, defined by austere forms of Christianity that devalued classical Greek and Roman texts, but they had their own really intellectual life. It's not a dig on medievalists. And though those books weren't valued in medieval Europe, those books found a home in Islamic Spain. Aristotle and Euclid were kept safe, and later these books would become indelible parts of the Western canon, which highlights an interesting paradox. It's easy to define the Crusades, or wars generally, as one uniform culture confronting another uniform culture, or to discuss these moments as clashes of civilization, but the reality is much more complicated than that. While forcing Islam and Judaism out of Iberia with the Inquisition, the culture of those people, the culture of curiosity and tolerance defined by a love of books and philosophy, ended up conquering the conquerors. As the Christians reconquered the Iberian Peninsula, including Cordoba with its mosque and library, European culture changed in the process. The High Middle Ages and Early Renaissance began to value the sorts of books that they would find in that library. Ferdinand III of Castile, for example, has inscriptions on his tomb in his Castilian vernacular, as well as Latin, but also Hebrew and Arabic. They may have conquered the land, but that spirit of tolerance and scholarship in the end conquered them. About two centuries later, when the king and queen of a united Christian Spain received the keys to the Alhambra, the final act of reconquest in 1492, it said that they wore Moorish clothing. Shortly after that, they signed a decree expelling all non-Christians and ending the tolerance that once existed on the peninsula but only temporarily. The philosophies of those Muslim thinkers, like Averroes among others, had an enduring impact on the secularism that would allow Europeans to start to learn from the pre-Christian thinkers again. After this conquest, Europeans started reading pre-Christian thinkers like Euclid and Aristotle for the first time in centuries. And it's good to remember this from time to time, that culture and history are much more complicated than we are sometimes led to believe that we're all humans with a shared and interconnected history, that all our thoughts influence the thoughts of others, that our mosques are built on top of Christian ruins, built on top of Roman ruins, and that we all, regardless of background or religious belief, feel disoriented in the best and most beautiful way when we stand inside this cathedral at Cordoba. And if you like this video, please consider subscribing. Thank you for watching.